Muchas gracias, Darío. Tuvimos en 2005 en Passion for Knowledge la oportunidad de oír al propio Seilinger contar sus experimentos y ahora, muchos años después, oírte hablar de cómo se realizan en los dispositivos de IBM es terriblemente esparanzador. Ha sido fantástico. Eta gaurko azken itzaldi nagusia entzuteko unea iritsi da Jean-Pierre Sauvage que mango du makina molekularraren sortzaileak. Jean-Pierre Sauvage obtuvo el premio Nobel de Química en 2016 por el diseño y síntesis de máquinas moleculares. Su equipo ideó el primer músculo molecular y creó junto a un equipo de investigadores experimentales un objeto de 8 nanómetros que se contrae y se relaja cuando recibe una señal. Un objeto que podría utilizarse, por ejemplo, como un mini robot articulado. Estamos seguros de que el tema ha despertado su curiosidad, así que damos la bienvenida a Jean-Pierre Sauvage, que nos ofrecerá la conferencia titulada Máquinas y motores moleculares de la biología a la química. Chalo Berbar. Do you hear me? The first question, you know, each time. Uh, very good. So I'm um, very, very happy to be here, of course. And um, I would like, if I can, get the first slide. Yeah. <coughs> Yes. So first, I would like to thank very, very warmly <laughs> the organizers of this meeting and the, the people who invited me, uh, Professor uh, Pedro Echenique, Professor Ricardo Diaz Muño, and all the people who helped, of course. Um, it is certainly a, a big, big uh, job to organize such a very nice meeting. So we will completely change topic um, and talk about molecules. Uh, and I hope you will uh, enjoy a very short introduction. I'm sure that there are many people in the audience who are not so familiar with molecules. Am I right? Yeah. And so, uh, very, very briefly, uh, molecules are assemblies which uh, contain atoms, of course, and these atoms have to be connected using chemical bonds. So I just to have two uh, examples on the top here. The water molecule, two hydrogen atoms, a central oxygen atom, and two classical bonds. CO2, we are talking about CO2 extensively, and CO2 is a very nice molecule, nice looking, a small bar, a carbon atom at the center, two oxygen atoms at the periphery. And CO2 has been highly criticized. You know. Everybody believed that CO2 is a very nasty molecule. It isn't. Without CO2, there is no photosynthesis. Without photosynthesis, there, are no, there is no life, basically, uh, on Earth and all the mammals uh, would disappear, and basically everybody would disappear. So what is the most important is to control the concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere, but we shouldn't try to get rid of it, otherwise it would be terrible. So two other very simple molecules, nitrogen. Uh, you see three small white bars here between the two nitrogen atoms, which means that you have a triple bond and the triple bond makes dinitrogen, which is the nitrogen we, we breathe uh, all the time, extremely stable. Um, and so it is very difficult to convert dinitrogen into something, something else. Uh, and this can be a problem because we need fertilizers, and fertilizers are mostly obtained by uh, converting dinitrogen to something else. 
ammonia or ammonium ions. <coughs> so another molecule, uh, which is still relatively simple, is benzene. Benzene is uh, a simple, very simple molecule. It consists of six carbon atoms, and those carbon atoms are uh, arranged as an hexa hexagon. And uh, this is a convention you, know, you have to, to know. Um, we do not represent carbon atoms by the letter C anymore. Uh, if we have a hexagon like that, uh, we just say that the vertices uh, indicate that you have carbon atoms here. We have six carbon atoms. And this is something you will see uh, during the lecture. We do not indicate C. You know, we, we have simply vertices in our uh, representations of the molecules. Now, a much more complicated molecule. I would like to say a few words about synthesis. You know, the, let's say the core uh, of, uh, of chemistry uh, is probably to make molecules, to make new molecules. Uh, this is, of course, absolutely essential to mankind uh, in um, basically any uh, <coughs> area of our activities. And these molecules can be used in medicine, pharmacy, agriculture, whatever. Uh, materials, and there is an, some kind of art, which is the art of making a molecule. And this one is kind of a record. Don't try even to look at it, it's really scary. And these molecules have been made, you know, using uh, many, many um, different reactions. Uh, it has been made by a group of researchers, Casey Nicolau, and in California. And uh, it took them something like 12 years to make the molecule, uh, but he was not alone. There were about 20 researchers working on the project. So if you calculate overall, uh, this compound took uh, more than two centuries of work uh, before it was made. So this is, I think, very impressive. Um, it is extremely useful because when you make complicated molecules, on the way, you discover new chemistry, new reactions, and so you offer to the international community uh, many, many tools, new tools, which will be used for making other molecules. So that was my uh, short introduction on uh, chemistry. I would like to go on on the nanometer. We heard many, many times a nanometer is a very tiny uh, object. Uh, this is very true, of course. And uh, so it's 10 to minus 9 meters, uh, very tiny. And there was a beautiful discovery already some time ago, totally accidental. Uh, the people in the UK and in the US uh, were trying to reproduce the conditions uh, which led to uh, molecules found in space. Space is full of molecules. So we have the feeling that uh, this is a vacuum. Uh, not at all, there are many molecules. Uh, of course, very dilute, uh, but considering the number of uh, cubic meters you have in space, uh, you reach a number of molecules which you cannot even imagine. And so they, they discovered that by trying to make uh, uh, molecules found in space, they could make another molecule, which was totally unexpected, and it was these species, uh, which they called uh, uh, fullerene, fullerene C60, because you, ha you have 60 atoms arranged as a soccer ball. So this is exactly a classical soccer ball. Nowadays, you have lots of colors, and the geometry is more complicated. But uh, to me, the nicest soccer ball is the classical one. And so ma they made a one nanometer size soccer ball. Beautiful work, and it opened a complete, completely new uh, and, and very uh, wide area of research. So this is still very, very active. One nanometer equals a 
tiny circuit board. <coughs> now, uh, let's uh, continue and look at synthetic molecules compared to biological molecules. And I have a, a two important statements here that synthetic molecules are considered as static. Of course, they move. They move a bit, they distort, they elongate. Uh, but uh, basically, we have no control over the, the motions of these molecules, so they undergo random uh, movements. Let's look at biological molecules. In biology, it is totally different. So controlled motion is absolutely essential, and uh, any living organism contains um, uh, motors, machines, in particular rotary motors, uh, even walkers, molecules that walk uh, on the road, uh, molecules which can contract or elongate, and uh, these molecules, most of the time, they belong to a very uh, wide family of molecules. They are called the motor proteins. And we will see two examples, uh, which are, I believe, really spectacular. ATP synthase, which will be the, the first one, and uh, you know or you don't know, that life relies on ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and adenosine triphosphate is the fuel of life, the fuel in biology. So if you drive your car, of course, you burn a fuel, you burn it, you generate CO2 and water, but when you move, when you do some effort, uh, you burn, or you do not burn, but you degrade another fuel, which is ATP. This is this complicated molecule, let's forget about the structure of it. But ATP is converted to ADP, the degraded form of uh, ATP. And nature is much more ecological than we are, because ADP, instead of throwing it away, uh, discarding it, it is recycled in your body. So you hydrolyze your ATP, you generate ADP, and thanks to what you eat and the fact that you breathe at the same time, you will regenerate ATP. And this is not a minor uh, process, because every day you regenerate about one half of your weight of ATP. You can easily calculate. You know, we are not in the gram scale, we are in the kilogram scale, even 10 kilogram scale. And this is a rotary motor, which is responsible for this regeneration of uh, ATP using the degraded form of it, ADP. It's a beautiful rotary motor. So uh, it has been studied extensively by biologists, and uh, there is a very nice video on the, in the web, or there are several videos, and they are not based on science fiction, but uh, this is very, very close to reality. Uh, as I said, there were hundreds and hundreds of detailed studies, very rigorous studies. Uh, it's a rotary motor. So this is embedded in a membrane uh, in the mitochondria, if you want to have more information. And uh, here you have your rotor. Uh, the axis of it, or the shaft, is threaded uh, through the cavity of a cluster of proteins. And as it spins here, uh, you make ATP, so you have ADP, the degraded form of ATP, which arrives with inorganic phosphate. And after some time, you see ATP, which is uh, coming out and uh, regenerated. So this is a beautiful process. And you have to know that everything which lives on Earth is based on this process. Basically, we have the same uh, system for regenerating ATP as the very, very primitive uh, uh, living organisms which appeared on Earth a couple of billion years ago. Uh, so that should make us feel a little bit more modest, by the way. <coughs> so another very um, beautiful example is that of the kinesin. The kinesin is a walker, and it walks on microtubules in the cell. Uh, it has a very precise function, transport matter. 
because in the cell you have biosynthesis uh, factories, you know, in some places, to make your proteins, to make your uh, pieces of DNA or RNA, uh, some hormones, many, many complex molecules. But those factories have to dispatch what they make, what they fabricate, and this is dispatched by this um, carrier, which is uh, the kinesin. So you have a long tubule, it's like the road, a highway, and the kinesin is here, it's a very tiny species, uh, not a big, big enzyme, not a big protein, uh, something like 300,000 Daltons, so not, not uh, particularly impressive. And uh, when the, the cell, uh, sorry, when, when the cell wants to, uh, wants to uh, transport or uh, the molecules which have been made at some place uh, to another place, uh, the kinesin enters the game. It's a walker, as I said, uh, not very, very large. And at the back of the kinesin, you have a huge bag, and the, this huge bag is full of molecules, the molecules which have to be transported to one place to another. So the kinesin is a carrier, if you like, and it will carry molecules uh, within the cell. A beautiful system. So now let's move on and uh, be more chemist. Let's say. We'll talk about chemistry. So there are molecules which are uh, very strange uh, because chemists like to, to make uh, surprising systems, surprising in terms of uh, chemical structure, and they also like to mimic biology very often. So let's look at a catenane or a rotaxane. So this is a catenane. Uh, it's a species which contains two interlocking rings, chemical rings, and these catenanes were uh, considered as almost impossible to make. So chemists have been discussing uh, those species since 1915 or so, so a long time ago, uh, but basically nobody could make them uh, in a clean and efficient way. And so uh, these species were, uh, let's say, um, appeared as less and less interesting because we couldn't make them. And so something had to happen because they have uh, exciting properties as you, as you will see in a few minutes. So um, Scheele, a German chemist, uh, could make very tiny amounts of a catenane, and this is historical uh, uh, work. And they published a paper in 1964, but nobody tried to repeat the work because it appeared as so difficult that um, everybody was discouraged, you know, even before starting. So the field kind of disappeared. It was a dormant field for more than 20 years. And so the question you may ask, what is the relationship between molecular machines and motors and catenanes? It's very clear. If you can make catenanes and rotaxanes, and if on top of that you can set the system in motion, uh, that can be very exciting. For instance, I have a problem with the remote. Yeah. For instance, if you have a species like that, maybe you can uh, send a signal to the molecule and the ring which was on the left will go to the right and come back to the left. So you will have something which is similar to a linear motor, like a piston moving in a cylinder. And here uh, you have systems which can be uh, very close to rotary motors. And so this is why many groups were interested in catenanes and rotaxanes and uh, were hoping for, let's say, um, good ways, efficient ways for making them. So when my group started in this field, uh, it was already some time ago, and with my former boss, Jean-Marie Lane, uh, when I was uh, kind of a 
uh, between assistant and associate CNRS professor, uh, we embarked on a project, very ambitious project, which was trying to split the water molecule to H2 and O2. And I should say that at the time, there were already many groups very excited about this project, trying to make dihydrogen using solar light. It's, a, of course, kind of a dream. If you can make dihydrogen using solar light and water, uh, you make the, the ideal fuel, because if you burn H2, you just generate water. Uh, and so there were already uh, quite a few groups working in this field. Uh, but we were lucky, and we had some kind of very positive results. Uh, although splitting the water molecule cleanly, efficiently, to hydrogen and oxygen uh, is still not realized. So we, we have to be patient before commercially available devices are, uh, will be on the market for generating H2 using solar light. And at the time, the, uh, the main, oops, sorry, the main, um, as I said, the main uh, <coughs> uh, compound for trying to speed the water molecule uh, was always the same. Everybody was using the same. And so we went from water splitting research to cationanes. And those two fields appeared as totally disconnected. There was no overlapping between cationanes and water splitting. But we were lucky, and uh, we were even adventurous, and so my advice to young scientists is be adventurous. So the compound that everybody was using at the time was ruthenium treated by pyridine. So this is a relatively simple structure. And uh, what you can see is that there was a ruthenium atom at the center, and that worked beautifully to, let's say, to do electron transfer, which, because for splitting the water molecule, you need uh, electron transfer. Uh, but there was a big problem. Ruthenium, if you remember your periodic table, is below iron, and it's a noble metal. What does it mean? A noble metal is extremely expensive. It is very rare. So if someday we want to have systems for splitting the water molecule to H2 and O2 using light, it cannot be a ruthenium catalyst. And so we thought, well, uh, maybe we should try to look for something else. And the something else will be a copper complex. And there was already some work carried out by Dave McMillan in the US at Purdue University. And Dave McMillan uh, and I, we knew each other from the literature, from international meetings. And uh, he went to Strasbourg. He decided to spend his sabbatical leave in Strasbourg in Jean-Marie Lane's laboratory. And uh, when he arrived, we had immediately lots of discussions about uh, what can we do with copper and try to find some, uh, some ways for making very efficient photocatalysts based on copper. We had made this molecule at the time, very simple molecule. So you have here a, it, this is called a phenantholine, but this is not important. It's a question-shaped molecule able to interact with a metal, a transition metal, via the two nitrogen atoms. So we had made this molecule, and he told us, well, we will collaborate, of course. You make the compounds, and we will do all the photophysics and the photochemistry. And we were very happy to do that, of course, because Dave McMillan was more a photophysicist. So we made this molecule, and it turned out to work beautifully. It had about the same properties as the ruthenium complex you have seen on the previous slide. But there was something else. And at the time, I was in charge of drawing the molecule. You know, that was uh, before ChemDraw and these softwares. And when you draw your molecules, in a way, you digest you know, their shape and their structure much, much better than just being on your computer. And there was something striking. If you materialize 
the two endpoints of this ligand here, of this part, let's say the, the vertical part. And separately, you will materialize the two endpoints of the other component, which is here. Now, just by your mind, uh, you can uh, interlink the two blue dots and separately the two red dots. And what do you obtain? You have an interlocking ring system. The two rings you generate will be interlocked, married forever, if you prefer. And we thought, well, the field of catenane is kind of virgin. Um, we will jump in it, stop more or less our work on catalysis, photochemistry, and all that, and try, try to make a catenane. And that was very easy thanks to the skill, the exceptional skill of uh, Christian Dietrich Buschecker, a very, very close friend who passed away already some time ago. And she was extremely uh, talented. She obtained a catenane within a couple of months. And we published the paper in Tetrahedron Letters. Um, so this is not important. Perhaps more important is that we published in French. We published in French because we thought if the people are interested in catenanes, they will have to read this paper. And then some people will discover that there are other languages than English or American. And that was the main purpose. Of course, it was very uh, stupid, I mean, uh, uh, childish, but uh, we liked it. <laughs> and so, just to show you a more modern uh, version of the, the strategy. We start from <coughs> this compound, and uh, we have copper, which arrives. Oops, my video. And you, you cyclize. And another strategy is to, to start from a ring, which has been kind of prefabricated, pre tintetized and we will uh, we will add copper, thread something in it, and finally cyclize. So we have two distinct strategies for making catenanes. And it worked beautifully. Uh, so we made those catenanes. Uh, that was already many, many years ago. Uh, we could visualize them because of a very beautiful technique, which is called X-ray crystallography. And this beautiful technique gives you 3D pictures of your molecules. And so here we have the copper containing system. Copper is green here. And uh, the other one, once you have removed copper, uh, you generate a species which is much more open with a lot of space, or a lot of voids. And uh, the two rings can glide more or less freely within one another. So that was the beginning of a field. Uh, and the field uh, was called, uh, mostly by us, uh, chemical topology, or molecular topology, uh, because the species which are represented here are topologically non-trivial, uh, but I think we have no time to discuss that. So that was the very first system, a catenane. Uh, the second one, a couple of years later, three catenane. We spent a lot of, of time a lot of effort on uh, making a trefoil knot, uh, but we succeeded, uh, and some other species. And for, let's say, six or seven years, we had no competitors, because I don't know why. We had no competitors, and the people in my group didn't like it. You know, they were a bit nervous. Are we doing something really of no interest? And this is the reason why nobody is trying to uh, uh, compete with our work. Um, I don't know, but of course, after six or seven years, uh, the community woke up, and, uh, and within uh, 10 or 15 years, there were several groups or many groups working in the field of topology. Now, uh, let me show you that uh, uh, novel topologies are very, very common in nature. And if you look at DNA, uh, circular duplex DNA, it forms 
uh, lots of topological figures, very exciting figures. And you have a couple of examples here. So you have uh, the trefoil knot with uh, DNA. This is natural. And you have here another catenane. It's a five-crossing catenane uh, here, beautiful. And the record was published uh, already some time ago. The record is a virus, HK97. It's a bacteriophage virus, so don't be scared. You know. uh, it's not going to infect anyone here. Uh, and the, the people could obtain the structure, so the exact shape of the envelope or the capsid of this virus. And you see that it's a chain mail. A chain mail with rings, protein rings, which are interlocking with one another, uh, like the chain mail uh, used by knights during the Middle Ages when they wanted to protect their bodies and uh, still be able to move, to fight with their, with their big swords. And uh, so this is a beautiful example of topology in molecular biology. So now, uh, let's take a look at the first molecular machine we made in Strasbourg. And it was made simultaneously to another uh, molecular machine made in the US. And so the, the principle is here. And I will try to explain clearly how do we move or do we set a system in motion? Um, it's quite simple. It's like any motion. You send a signal to the species. It is destabilized. It doesn't like the, the new state you know, uh, it has to take. And then it will react by moving. And this is exactly what happens. Here, we have copper 1 plus. You have to know that copper has basically two states, copper 1 plus and copper 2 plus. Copper 1 plus likes to be uh, coordinated or linked to four nitrogen atoms, like here, one, two, three, four, arranged as a tetrahedron. Very simple. Everybody is happy here. Now we will send the signal. We destabilize the system. We abstract an electron from copper one. We generate copper two plus. Copper two plus is much more demanding in terms of what it likes to have in its uh, surrounding. And so copper two plus uh, likes to be surrounded by five nitrogen atoms, not four. Here, you have a very unhappy uh, copper two, so the complex is highly uh, destabilized after electron transfer, and so a ring will glide, and the three nitrogen atoms which were here at the beginning will replace the two nitrogen atoms which were here in this uh, molecule, so as to generate a, a very happy copper 2 plus with one, two, three, four, five nitrogen atoms, very stable. You can go back, you inject an electron uh, into the system here, copper 2 plus to copper 1 plus. Now this is this guy, which is very uh, strongly destabilized, and the system will rotate. So we have a small video, which uh, I think shows the, the principle. Uh, you have copper 1, which is uh, reddish, copper 2, which is uh, uh, green, more or less. And now you will... Oops, you will send, you abstract an electron from copper one, you generate a very stable species now by rotating a ring, you can re-inject an electron, etc. So that was the very, very beginning of the field, and uh, there are weak points, everything is slow, uh, we have no control over direction, directionality, uh, but uh, it worked uh, beautifully. And simultaneously, our good friends, uh, Fraser Stoddart and his co-workers, published the first molecular shuttle. The molecular shuttle is quite simple. You have a ring which can move from the, from the green station to the red station and go back to the green station just by sending signals. And these are electrical signals. So that was very nice. 
And uh, later on, uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago or so, uh, they published a, a nice paper, which probably will never be used you know, uh, in terms of uh, applications, uh, but they could write, uh, erase, and, and read uh, using a rotaxane. It's a very long rotaxane. They attach both ends here uh, on uh, two nano electrodes, and they can move the ring which is here. So they set it in motion. It will go from the green station to the red station if you send an electrical signal. It can go back if you send another electrical signal, of course, the opposite. And the beauty is that you can read the system by measuring the electronic conductivity of the, the wire, which is here, or let's say a bundle of wires. So you can exactly do you know, what, you, what you want. You can write by, let's say, um, keeping the ring in this original position and sending it here. You will say you have zero and one. Then you can read by measuring electronic conductivity. And finally, you can erase by applying a high potential. So that was spectacular. But, and there is a big but, molecules are very unstable species. If you do that 100 times or 1,000 times, basically uh, the system will be totally destroyed because those molecules suffer uh, a lot uh, when you apply potentials on them. So I will uh, go on, and I'm close to the end. Uh, something we made uh, more recently and which uh, seemed to attract the attention of the community uh, was an artificial muscle. And before we see this uh, muscle, um, you have to know how real muscle, our striated muscle function. Uh, muscles are not like a spring, you know, you do not contract matter, uh, but uh, water, you have filaments which can glide along one another. So the thin filaments, actin, and the thick filaments at the center of the system. And when those um, <coughs> filaments glide along one another, you can contract or you can elongate. So if you contract, of course, you consume ATP, you know, again, our fuel. And uh, when you relax, you know that uh, it's not very tiring. So the system goes back spontaneously to its relaxed form. And we thought it would be perhaps uh, exciting to make uh, a system of this type. And this is what we, we did. We made a, it's a rotaxane dimer. You have a pale blue unit here, a dark blue unit. And both are not connected by any covalent bond, but they are mechanically linked. And so the, the molecular system is very complex. I don't want to bother you with uh, the complete description of the system. But what you can do is quite uh, simple you can contract the system uh, from 8 nanometers down to 6 nanometers by sending a signal and go back to the 8 nanometers. And we are using chemical signals, um, a little bit like in biology with ATP. And that, that triggered uh, kind of a new field because several groups embarked in the synthesis of materials uh, fibers, now there are fibers which you can uh, contract or elongate just by changing the pH uh, in, in the surrounding of the fiber. So let me <coughs> finish up the, the scientific part uh, by uh, describing the very, very first photochemically driven uh, rotary motor. And this is the work of Ben Feringa uh, and his group. Feringa is in, uh, and his group are in the Netherlands, in Groningen, the very north of, uh, of the Netherlands. And they have done beautiful work. They are photochemists, so they make molecules. And uh, they, of course, look at the way these molecules react if you shine light on them. This is a little bit complex, and I will not uh, discuss that uh, at all. 
but they published a beautiful video, which I hope uh, you will like. So you have here a CC double bond. This is not important, but it, it's a bond between two fragments, one fragment here, another fragment here. And the system will rearrange. There will be a rotation about this CC double bond here, which is triggered by a photochemical signal, a thermal signal, a photochemical signal, and a thermal signal. So you need four signals for performing a complete uh, turn of the system. So you shine light, it rotates, you hit, shine light again, it rotates, and so now you have performed a complete uh, turn. And at the beginning, it took them maybe one afternoon for one turn. So that was not especially efficient. Uh, but nowadays, they are in the nanosecond time scale. So the system was improved enormously, and uh, the system rotates at, a, at an incredible speed. Um, and so it shows that if you insist, if you in really invest uh, uh, time and money and work, uh, you can improve systems which seem to be very inefficient at the beginning and which are really impressive uh, at the end of the day. So let me finish up by uh, thanking uh, uh, some people. Of course, what I spoke about is completely collective. It's a teamwork. We have team results. Uh, we have been quite a large number of people working in the field. Uh, today, I'm the one uh, who is speaking, uh, but there were many uh, researchers, permanent researchers, uh, university professors, postdocs, PhD students. And without them, of course, I wouldn't tell you anything. Uh, the, the CNRS uh, was very helpful, of course, my university. The European communities have always been very generous uh, to us. Uh, I work nowadays in a new institute, uh, which was founded by uh, Jean-Marie Lane, but it was not my institute before. Uh, I also would like to thank Northwestern University, uh, because when the CNR has suggested me very strongly to retire, I had to obey, of course, and I had an offer from Northwestern. Uh, my good friend Jean-Marie and uh, my postdoc, uh, a bus when I was a postdoc in Oxford, uh, Malcolm Green, uh, my family, and my two Nobel friends, Fraser Stoddart and Ben Feringa. And of course, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>